Variants Vaccines Part 2. Thank you for joining this sixth COVID-19 community update. My name is Lynn Fitzgibbons and it's March 2nd, 2021. As with prior updates, we will begin with a review of our community's condition and then talk about vaccines in our community and around our state. Finish with a description of what to know about variants this week and this month and conclude as usual with pearls or important take home points for this week. Starting with Santa Barbara County as a whole, the news is of course very good. Here we see from our Santa Barbara County Community Dashboard data from March of last year, the beginning of our epidemic, through our summer surge, then of course this very impressive dramatic winter surge that we all experienced, and a quite remarkable downturn just over this last month, month and a half, with the good news from our public health department yesterday of only 33 new cases reported in the county in one day. A remarkable change from nearly 800 at one point just a month and a half ago. When we then look at the number of patients hospitalized in Santa Barbara County on any given day, remember the top curve here are the total hospitalized and the darker red are those who are in the ICU, both with confirmed COVID-19. We again see very good news. That very significant hospital surge, which really strained so many of our systems, has of course abated. And the same is true in the ICU, as we see in the region and the local ICU capacity. Following hospitalizations, of course, is the, the curve of deaths. And this has been simply tragic. Um, as we can see from this graph, we've had actually the majority of our deaths really since November of last year, um, with the winter surge hitting our community incredibly hard, as it has really throughout our region and throughout our state, throughout our country. But the good news is that the trend over these last three weeks has certainly been downward. And really week over week, um, thankfully, fewer of our community members are succumbing to this horrible disease. Looking then at case rates, as we look forward perhaps and not back, we can see here um, both the state's adjusted case rate through yesterday in black, which had dropped all the way to about 16 last week, but also in real time, we can actually see on the community dashboard this wonderful feature, which tells us really day to day what the actual calculated case rate is, even before we get our official report card from the state. Of course, we did get our official report card from the state today, and it's good news. I'll have that information in a couple of slides. But what you see here is, uh, of course, we still are clearly in that purple tier, but moving closer and closer towards at least the current cutoff between purple and red. And similarly, percent positivity. Here you see again, in white, um, leading all the way up until the end of February, the calculated um, Kate percent positivity, which of course is continuing to drop in very, very reassuring news. This, remember, is the percentage of all tests that are done that are positive for COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 infection. And in black, again, you see the state's official calculations, which are always reported a couple of weeks um, after the fact. And then also the health equity metric, which is uh, making sure that those census tracts that are um, for people who are perhaps the most medically fragile or socially fragile in our community reside, making sure that their percent positivity is also improving. Um, unfortunately, not as well as the average across our community, but certainly showing significant improvement also. All, I think, very good news. <clears throat> and so what was the news today from the governor? So the news today from the governor was that under the Blueprint for a Safer Economy framework, which remember is the color tiering system, relying on, of course, the two numbers we just reviewed, the daily case rates and the testing positivity, under this framework, our report card today is continuing to look better. We remain in the purple tier, which of course means widespread disease and many non-essential indoor business operations are still closed. But in very encouraging news, we are seeing that our new case rate, this is the number of new people diagnosed per day, averaged over the last week, and, uh, and also controlled for every 100,000 Santa Barbara County residents, 
that case rate has really plummeted from a peak of right around 100 just a couple of months ago or six, seven weeks ago, all the way down to 15.0 now. And then remember, because we do a lot of testing in our community, we get a very positive adjustment factor where that raw number of 15.0 is adjusted downward with our final adjusted case rate for this week from the state of California to be 13.0. For percent positivity, um, 5.1 today reported and our health equity quartile positive rate, 8.2%. I think uh, the implications of this, we're clearly still in purple um, as the purple tiers are defined currently. Um, but I think very good news, those of you who have been following, for example, the different criteria that have been established to allow youth sports to um, go back in, in more usual operations, um, as well as other, I think, um, recreation activities. Of course, dropping below the threshold of 14 was very symbolic and very important. And so I think, uh, for many reasons, good news today. I will point out, however, that this decrease from 16 to 13 um, week over week is actually a smaller decrease than we've seen in prior weeks. And so um, what I mean, of course, is that while ongoing improvement is always going to be viewed as good, um, it is important to note that the speed with which that improvement is occurring may be slowing slightly. Um, still too early to tell, but I think over the next, of course, one, two, three weeks, I think we should continue to follow these numbers very, very closely, as we, of course, will. Transitioning then to COVID vaccines. Again, the Santa Barbara Community Dashboard is just a wealth of information. You can see here the total doses administered of vaccine in Santa Barbara County, a huge 93,701. And remember that this data um, lags by about three days just uh, because it takes clinics a certain amount of uh, time to input the data, the state to register it, and for it to be viewable on the dashboard. But I think uh, really remarkable that we are right there, right around 100,000 doses administered of vaccine in Santa Barbara County. We now have about 7% of our population fully vaccinated, a very significant and very positive start. And for those who are interested, especially um, related to vaccines and doses administered around our county and within different demographic areas of our county. Um, again, the dashboard is, uh, is rich with information. We see, of course, our county population breakdown by race and ethnicity, and you can follow closely here and see where the vaccine administrations have been with regards to race and ethnicity. Unfortunately, some missing data, which throws off this information slightly, but I think uh, very important to continue to follow. And just to conclude with uh, just a huge congratulations to everyone involved with the vaccine effort as Santa Barbara County really does uh, approach 100,000 doses administered. So what changed with the state in the last couple of weeks? The vaccine allocation guidelines did change. Remember our first priority back in late December were those frontline healthcare workers who were facing this quite overwhelming surge of COVID-19 in our hospitals and our healthcare systems. In parallel to that was the effort to vaccinate and protect skilled nursing and long-term care residents. And that effort has been largely very, very successful. You see here the total number of Californians um, that fell into that phase 1A group, um, over 3 million people. And again, at this point, our understanding is that all in phase 1a have now had the opportunity to be vaccinated and here in Santa Barbara County very very good uptake amongst that phase 1a group and so now the good news on February 13th the state and our local public health leaders announced that we are moving into phase 1b with a focus on those over 65 plus and those essential workers as outlined here Yet again, uh, huge gratitude to everyone involved with this very significant vaccine effort to protect not just the most fragile and the most vulnerable to this infection and its complications, uh, which would be those long-term care residents and those over the age of 65, but of course our essential workers who are really those at risk of continuing to spread 
this disease, those who are perhaps the most vulnerable simply based on their occupation. And so I think very positive steps are being made in parallel to continue to vaccinate, again, those over 65, um, while concurrently vaccinating our essential workforce. News last weekend from the FDA that the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine was granted an EUA, an emergency use authorization. This, of course, being the third vaccine to receive such an authorization. Remember that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is quite different from the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which are already being deployed in that it is a single dose vaccine series. You do not need to follow up at three or four weeks. You get one shot and then you are fully vaccinated. It has much easier storage requirements. It doesn't have this deep freeze requirement, but rather it can remain frozen for two years, but when out of a freezer and in a refrigerator, it remains viable, usable and working well for up to three months in just a regular refrigerator setting. Again, this really opens the door for many, many more corners of our community, our region to get vaccine. It's not an mRNA vaccine like the other two that have been granted EUAs thus far, but rather it is an adenovirus vector vaccine where an adenovirus that doesn't replicate, doesn't continue to replicate in humans is actually given a bit of DNA that encodes the spike protein simply a different way to get that code for or that blueprint for the virus spike protein into the vaccine recipient to then make the spike protein to teach or train our body how to respond to the spike protein if or when we come in contact with the virus in the future. Again, just a different technique rather than injecting mRNA itself coated in lipid, this is taking a more traditional vaccine approach um, using a different virus with a, a code for the spike protein. And so what does the data look like so far? Well, it looks very, very good. We have information from a phase three clinical trial that was conducted very comprehensively in eight countries across three continents, 43,000 participants, and really excellent efficacy in the United States, 72 to 74% um, of all comers. And the effectiveness or efficacy against severe disease was even better, 78% to 85%. So very, very good news. We're going to finish up talking about variants, but I will digress slightly into the variant information that we know from Johnson & Johnson, and it's very, very encouraging. As part of the J&J &J clinical trial, they did do sequencing for a large number of the cases that uh, were found during the trial. And what you see here is the breakdown by the three different major regions um, where this vaccine was tested. And what's very interesting is as the J&J &J data, this J&J &J data was released, we were of course learning more and more about different variants of concern around the world. And what you see with the J&J &J data is a very clear difference in how well this vaccine seemed to work in a place like the United States where there were no, at the time, um, significant percentage variants of concern circulating. Um, and again, they, they confirmed that 96% of the strains um, that were seen in this study in the United States were actually what we kind of think of now as the wild type virus, the D614G. In converse, the South African data, as you see here, um, was actually very different. And what they showed was that in South Africa, the cases of COVID-19 seen um, that broke, seen through the trial, 94% of them were actually this very concerning B1351 variant that we're learning more and more about. Um, and so I think uh, all this to say, the J&J &J vaccine in the United States really performed incredibly well. Even in Brazil and South Africa, by old vaccine standards, it performed very, very well. And I think uh, this is perhaps our first or our biggest glimpse into the impact that variants may have on vaccine efficacy. So then the question comes up, which vaccine should I get? 
And this is an important question now that we have so many good options, really with all three vaccines on the market performing very, very well. I think uh, my editorial comment on this, and I've spoken to our um, some of our public health leaders locally, um, our infectious disease experts uh, around the area, uh, around the region, and I think a fairly universal response to this from public health and infectious disease physicians is that you should get the vaccine that you have first access to. And let me show you why. The New York Times released this information last week, and I think it really speaks to the power of the vaccine rollout effort and the power of getting a vaccine as quickly as possible. Here you see in gray all United States COVID deaths, and in red you see the deaths among nursing home residents. And what you see, I think uh, here very dramatically, was the sharp decline in nursing home deaths that occurred so very quickly after the vaccine rollout began. The community cases continued to rise, the community deaths continued to rise, and yet this very vulnerable population that has been historically hit so hard by the epidemic really felt a tremendous amount of protection from the vaccine rollout. All this to say, the J&J &J vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, these vaccines all work very well. There is no one vaccine that is best for one particular population, but rather these vaccines should be meeting people where they are. If you have access to a vaccine, once you are eligible for a vaccine, I would simply strongly encourage you to proceed. So let's finish with some comments about variants. We've seen this before, the virus cycle through a host cell in blue. And you see the virus here on the left using its spiky red proteins, its spike proteins on the outside to bind to the ACE2 receptor on the edge of the cell, and then to enter the cell, to unpack itself, to go through its cycle, to make more of itself, more proteins, more copies of its RNA, and then to bud out uh, on the right-hand side to go on to infect the next cell. I always start with the virus cycle when we talk about variants because I think it's critically important to remember that anything that is going to impact how that spike protein can interact with that ACE2 receptor is going to impact the epidemic. It could potentially make a virus more infectious, it could potentially make it bind tighter and longer, and it could potentially affect how the virus is actually behaving within a person's body. So let's look at the variants of concern as defined by the CDC. And we have a new dashboard that's available. Um, here's a copy of it from the CDC where you can look at any of the three current variants of concern and see the current updated number of cases that have been reported in the United States. The B117, of course, originally reported in Southeast England um, and now seen in many parts of the world, increasing numbers throughout the US. The B1351, um, originally reported in Southern Africa and South Africa specifically, again, now seen in the United States. And P1, originally reported in a group of Brazilian travelers to Japan, but now found to be um, really quite dominant in parts of Brazil and reported in the United States. I'll comment that the B1351 is the virus, the variant that was predominantly reported in the South African experience with the J&J &J vaccine. And the vaccine still, of course, worked well against it, but not quite as well as the more general or wild type virus that we had circulating in the US during that study. And the P1 variant is, I think, uniquely concerning. Um, because the P1 variant um, in parts of Brazil really seemed to have caused another surge of infection amongst people who already had the infection. Again, the idea that that spike protein may have changed in such a way that even if you had some protection from previously being infected, you were still vulnerable to getting reinfected. And that kind of a shift, that kind of a change with a new variant certainly has, I think, the attention of all of the infectious disease specialists in the world. 
So what's going on in California? And uh, of course, the question is how much sequencing is actually being done in California? The good news is that our state health department is working very hard to increase the amount of sequencing. And sequencing is, of course, just the very specific way to look for different variants. At this point, um, the most recent data reported by the state is that we have B117 variant found in 206 cases in California. The B1351, the South African variant, found in a couple of cases in California. And P1, that Brazilian uh, variant, has not yet been found or detected in California. In addition to the variants of concern, there has been a lot of discussion in the last week about a specific pair of variants of interest here in California. The state's monitoring this very, very closely. And these variants of interest have been given different names, the West Coast variant, some people are calling it the um, California variant, or even the Santa Clara variant, where it was really first uh, um, described widely. But technically, these variants are B1427 or B1429. And what's very interesting is that groups out of places like UC San Francisco and Cedar sinai have looked at the amount of this variant that was circulating in the late fall in samples from their labs and compared it to the amount that they're finding now. And what they're seeing is a very significant increase in the percentage of samples that they're testing that are one of these two variants of interest. This raises all sorts of questions about whether this variant is more infectious, whether this variant may cause more disease, whether these variants may be slightly more resistant to the vaccines that we're using right now. And the good news is we have uh, many groups that are studying this, um, including some uh, pre-publications coming out this week related to exactly this set of questions. The final question I think many of us have been asking is, could it be that part of the experience Southern California in particular has had um, but California as a whole has had with this very, very severe winter surge, could it in, in fact be that some of this, uh, a part of this, a component of this experience and uh, severity of this surge has been related to perhaps a more infectious variant circulating around our state? And I think, uh, again, we don't yet know. I think the good news is the preliminary information from the state this week is that we don't have conclusive evidence that these variants of concern are dramatically more infectious or are associated with increased severity of illness. Um, but again, I think there's more to be learned and uh, I think more to come probably within the next one or two weeks. So what's going on locally? Well, the good news is that locally, we have very strong partnerships and collaborations really across many organizations in the Santa Barbara County area. And so there's been a local variant task team established with infectious diseases, lab science, and in public health experts from Cottage, from UC Santa Barbara, from Marion Regional Medical Center, and from our public health department, really tasked with tackling this specific question regarding local variants. In addition to the work of the task team, there are several testing efforts well underway. The state is requesting a small number of samples to be sent to them, uh, which meets certain criteria to do sequencing and to test for variants. And here in Santa Barbara County, we've been sending these samples for many weeks now and are pleased to have a small number of results back. There's also a research project underway in the last two weeks out of UC Santa Barbara. And uh, another testing effort research project that's a collaboration currently between UC Santa Barbara, Cottage Health, with other organizations um, potentially joining in the coming weeks, where we can more locally and more quickly partner to get some answers on whether we have local variants of concern or local variants of interest circulating here in Santa Barbara County. Um, and earlier this week, Sonia Fernandez released some information regarding some of the research efforts well underway. So I'll finish with a question that I think has been asked in the last 72 hours um, 
over and over again, um, both on the national level, but also on the state level. If you look here from the COVID tracking project from March of last year to this last week, you of course see our initial spring small surge, our summer surge, our slightly bumpy winter surge with regards to new daily cases, um, although it was certainly huge. And then what you see is this very dramatic drop off with an improvement in case rates until about a week ago. And then we hit a plateau. And the plateau that we've hit is actually right around the level or perhaps a bit higher than the level of the peak of our summer surge. And so our case rates, our numbers nationally remain very high, but that improvement, that ongoing week over week improvement seems to have stalled and many people are asking why there's a proposal that perhaps on top of some baseline ongoing activity we simply had an intense spike or set of spikes related to the holidays and as those intense spikes have melted away we're seeing more of the background activity related to COVID-19 around the country the second is that as things have improved so quickly over recent weeks, many things have reopened and unfortunately transmissions have restarted, um, that perhaps we should uh, really pull back on some of the reopening efforts that have happened across the country. And the third and perhaps most concerning suggestion is that in the background to all of our success have become um, more circulating variants and that as we've improved our community's condition and indeed our nation's condition with regards to COVID-19, unfortunately, we have also had in the background momentum building with regards to the number or the percentage of variants of concern or variants of interest. And so I think the good news is that we know more now than we ever knew before. And I think uh, at the end of the day, this simply reminds us that the fight is not over, the battle is not completely won, um, but perhaps time to really strengthen our resolve to continue to improve this curve. Here we see a blow up really of the last um, three months or two months, excuse me, where you really can see that there has been a plateau over perhaps even more than a week. Um, again, just a reminder of uh, the work we still have ahead. And so finishing off with pearls for this week, things are clearly improving, but that improvement may be slowing nationally and locally. The vaccine efforts continue to increase in Santa Barbara County with both larger and smaller scale vaccine clinics now working well throughout the county and really ready for more vaccine supply, which we hear is coming soon equitable access to not just the vaccines, but also vaccine information continues to be a primary focus of our public health experts, and I think many of us around the community. Vaccination well underway for those over 65 years, as well as now expanding to essential workers. And finally, understanding variants and knowing what changes are happening with the relative frequency of different variants within a community are going to be critical in this next chapter of the pandemic. I would urge though that we use this information about variants for good. We use this to empower us, not to scare us. Because these variants have been evolving and changing for over a year now. And we know that we were beating whatever the recent enemy was. We're just learning a little bit more perhaps about how strong um, or how infectious that enemy may well have been. And I'll finish by thanking you for your attention and uh, please remember to continue to wear your mask. <laughs>